I'm your host, Nabil Fahel, and I'm the Director of Partnerships here at Terminal. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. And if you're a returning guest, welcome back. If you're not familiar with Terminal, at Terminal, we believe in bringing global opportunities to global talent. We partnered with some amazing companies to make sure that those companies can access the best people wherever they are. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Terminal, just head over to terminal.io. And I know we have a bunch of engineers on the call as well who are software developers and technical talent. So if any of you are interested in learning more about the job opportunities available across all of our partners, just head over to terminal.io slash openings. You'll see all of the jobs listed there. Having said that, it's uh, my great pleasure to be kicking off this program. I'm sitting here in Canada. Uh, one of our speakers, Ron, is out in the San Francisco Bay Area. And our other speaker, Tarek Fahmi, is actually all the way over in Italy. So um, it's great to be able to be doing this. Um, and it's great to be able to bring these amazing speakers to you. With the Terminal Tech Talk series, we want to bring world-class speakers who want to share their hard-earned learnings on subject matters that you care about. So um, Ron actually started his career almost 30 years ago in 1992. He, he started off working at uh, Texas Instruments and then moved over to Sun Microsystems. And, and that's where he kind of kicked off his career as an engineer. But he's gone on over the course of multiple decades to have some extremely interesting uh, engineering leadership roles that he's gonna be talking about shortly. And we're really, really thrilled to have Ron as one of our very first executives in residence here at Terminal. And we're really excited to be able to bring these executives, not just to you through this programming, but also to the members who work at Terminal who can have private mentoring sessions with them and have already done so. On, in, in Tarek Fahmi's case, Tarek actually is from Egypt originally, and he moved to Canada to attend the University of Waterloo, uh, which has an incredible reputation for pumping out some incredible technical talent. And then uh, he founded a company called Tafasa in Toronto, which was building tons and tons of mobile apps, uh, some of which have had uh, tens of millions of downloads. And then ultimately, he moved to the San Francisco Bay Area to become the first mobile engineer at Wish. And over the course of an eight and a half year run, he managed to you know, build out 150 person plus engineering organization uh, and helping lead, leading product and, and engineering at Wish. And he's gonna be talking a little bit more about his journey and the story arc of his career as well. So, um, I'm really thrilled that you're joining us. I just want to do a couple of housekeeping things here where we are here for you. This program is for you. So if you would like to ask any questions, feel free to do so right in the little chat widget there on the screen for those of you who are at terminal.io slash live stream. Um, any of the questions uh, that are popped in there, we'll try and get to them accordingly. And um, thank you very much in advance for anybody that does ask questions. So having said that, and without any further ado, I wanted to turn it over to Ron, who can tell us a little bit more about his career in tech and bring us kind of up to speed with kind of all the things that he's been able to build out across multiple different seminal technology companies. So over to you, Ron. Thank you, Nabil. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here joining you from San Francisco. Um, yeah, as Nabil pointed out, I've been in this industry for quite a while. I got my undergraduate degree in uh, 1992. I'm from Chicago originally and got my undergraduate degree from University of Illinois um, and have been in tech ever since. So as I started my career out at Texas Instruments down in Dallas, Texas, so got to spend a bit of time down there. Um, after there, I moved to the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, started working for Sun. and. Um, you know, one thing that was pointed out to me is that Sun was sort of considered the Google of its time. If you could take take Sun and put it in present day, that would kind of be uh, how it would be regarded. Um, but after joining those first two companies at the beginning of my career, both large, successful brand name multinational companies, um, I got the I actually got the startup bug. And so this was just the path that I chose is that I've only ever joined private, privately held startup companies since 1998. Um, and so from 98 
uh, through 2004 about. There were three startups I joined. One of them was during the dot-com boom and subsequent bust, which was an amazing and interesting time to be in technology. Um, from 2004 through about 2014, I joined two companies that are now fairly well known. One was Salesforce, but at the time it was a fairly small company. The, uh, the engineering team was three dozen and I was one of those, lucky to join at that time and stayed there for quite a while. Uh, and then the, and had the IPO as well experience, which was amazing. Um, the next company I joined was Twitter. I also joined it pre-IPO um, and was a part of, part of that scale up and was really fortunate to be at a company uh, twice in a row that happened to IPO. Amazing, amazing fortune, definitely serendipity. Um, and from that point forward, uh, from 2014 onward, I've held VP level roles at a few companies, including uh, BigCommerce, AppDirect, and most recently Carta. And it's really interesting too, from afar to observe um, some of the success of, of one of the companies there, BigCommerce. They also subsequently went IPO earlier this year. And so uh, really, really, had great fortune to work with great teams, help scale up good businesses. And it's wonderful to be able to say that I've, I've played some small part in scaling up those teams and those companies to, to the point where they're hopefully well-known brands now and into the future. So I've been very fortunate. And now, you know, uh, most recently being part of this executive and residence program at Terminal and being able to reach out through this community, which, uh, which I, I, you know, I hope that you'll find valuable. So thanks for having me part of this. Thanks so much, Ron. And, uh, and yeah, we're thrilled to have you here as well. Um, in terms of, yeah, speaking of uh, IPOs, um, you know, Tarek's been a, a big part of the, the Wish success story. And um, I never miss an opportunity to point out the fact that uh, he's a University of Waterloo grad. And in fact, the co-founder and CEO, Peter of Wish, is also a University of Waterloo uh, grad. And so um, I just uh, actually read a couple of days ago that um, Wish has uh, filed for the S1 uh, to, to, to do their own IPO later this year. So I wanted to start off by congratulating uh, Tarek for you know, many years of the fruits of his labor coming to fruition. And I'm sure that you're really proud for the rest of your team as well, former team, I should say, um, because now Tarek is joining us from Italy where he moved very recently to pursue his passions in supercar product development and basically the intersection of tech and um, uh, tech and supercars. Um, so he's now joining us from the heart of what's called Motor Valley. Um, I believe he's specifically in Bologna, Italy. But um, uh, Tarek, could you could you kind of take a moment to kind of bring our viewers up to speed on kind of the story arc of, of your career and, and what's brought you to modern day? And then maybe later we could take some questions on whatever's on people's mind, be it, you know, uh, supercars or engineering or otherwise. Over to you, Tarek. Thanks, Nabil. And uh, yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, so, you know, as Nabil said, I, I grew up in Egypt. I spent my entire childhood there. So as we are still trying to get Tarek's feedback, I think, uh, I must have jinxed it by bragging about uh, where he is in the world. But in any case, uh, we're going to be working on trying to get Tarek back into the feed. Um, I'm sure he'll reconnect momentarily. But uh, perhaps I could turn it back over to you, Ron, um, because I know that you have had um, a long career of actually managing uh, remote teams all over the world. And so um, maybe we could start off with that question because I believe that right now a lot of the tech industry is in either voluntarily or forced kind of uh, re remote by default lockdown mode. Um, and so could you speak a little bit to your career in, in having, you know, managed people from afar and, and you know, what tips uh, that you have for our viewers in terms of whether they're on uh, your side of the equation or on the other side of the equation being managed by a remote leader? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a really great question. It's also one that I think more and more organizations are facing right now. If you have the ability to work remotely, people will do it, but it comes with its own challenges. And, you know, actually throughout my career, whether it was at Salesforce or Twitter, or maybe more, you know, more recently at some of my more recent companies, BigCommerce, AppDirect, and Carta, 
I've had a remote component of my teams. Um, some, you know, it's really interesting in the sense of remote. It, uh, you know, that term almost uh, seems like something that should be try we should try to avoid. In that, you know, we're all different team members. We all just happen to live in different parts of of the planet. And you know, I saw this pretty vividly at some of my teams, including, you know, I had teams in Sydney, uh, I've had teams in Canada, uh, with Montreal and up near Toronto. Um, I've had teams in South America. And, you know, well, the one interesting thing is like, okay, talent exists everywhere on this planet. Um, and it's, it's a bit about making sure that uh, companies find the talent that they need and provide them the opportunities to, to do what they can, no matter where they are. Um, one thing that I've I've learned from leading these remote teams is it really is important for the leader of these teams or leaders to have empathy for what it's like to live on the other end uh, of the line. And so, you know, one one experience that I have vividly in my mind is um, I was in San Francisco leading the engineering team, and I had team members in India. And if you can visualize the globe. Uh, India and San Francisco are pretty much diametrically opposed on the planet. Um, and with that, you know, comes the time zone delay and the distance and the feeling of remoteness or disconnectedness that is possible from teams that are that, that distributed. Um, and so, you know, for me as a leader, it was important for me, like I said before, to have empathy for what it was like to work, work from these different locations wherever I had team members including India. And, you know, it takes a long time to get there, but made it, you know, made it a point to get there several times a year. And it's just a very, very different experience. If you are in some of these different geographic locations and you experience what it's like to try to communicate, ask questions, get answers and coordinate from these different time zones where uh, honestly you might have to wait, you know, 12, 18, 24 hours for, for a response. Um, it really, it really shapes you as a leader. And I, you know, in one way, I think the leader has to have that empathy. I think also for the team members, they also too have to understand um, it's, it's okay to remind people in other parts of the planet where you work, what your day like times are and share a bit about like, what are the, what are the friction points? What are the things that are preventing you from being as productive as possible? And by having that transparency and the two-way communication, you, you know, you remind the leadership and headquarters, wherever it might be, um, you know, how, how to make you and your team more successful. Well, thanks for, for that very insightful answer. And it looks like we have Tarek back. So we're gonna try this again. Um, so um, Tarek, if you could just, uh, for our listeners and viewers, if you can bring them up to speed on uh, your career to date, um, from Egypt to Canada to America and now to Italy, um, that would be appreciated. Thanks, Emil. Sorry, guys, some technical issues here in Italy. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I, I grew up in Egypt. Uh, that's where I spent my entire childhood. Uh, graduated high school there and moved to Canada uh, to go to the University of Waterloo. Um, for those not familiar with the University of Waterloo, uh, it's a typically an engineering program there. It's a co-op program, so you end up doing six internships throughout your time there. Um, so for my first internship, I, uh, I went to BlackBerry. Uh, it was called Research in Motion back then. It's kind of a rite of passage that every intern really went through uh, at Waterloo. Uh, I used that experience. I was kind of hoping to get introduced to mobile app development. Uh, but Unfortunately, uh, I actually ended up being on a team that had nothing to do with mobile app development. So my second term, I decided to go for a startup that was focusing on BlackBerry app development. And unfortunately, again, I wasn't placed on a project that was doing any app development. So decided to kind of take matters in my own hands and start developing something on the side. Um, at that point, BlackBerry had just launched the BlackBerry Storm. Uh, if anyone remembers that, it was their touchscreen device that was meant to compete with the iPhone. Um, you know, BlackBerry had a huge following, so they sold a bunch of them. Um, it wasn't the greatest of devices, but it was, you know, pretty capable feature-wise, uh, and it had a good developer ecosystem around it. So as an iPhone user, I saw an opportunity of taking apps that I enjoyed using on the iPhone and building them out for the BlackBerry. Uh, it started off with a, a few small games, uh, and then it started kind of picking up, and I noticed there was a lot of interest in it. There was a lot of people that were downloading it, and, and 
um, there's a lot of demand for more of those types of apps. And that's kind of where uh, the company I created um, is kind of a sole proprietorship that I ran uh, while I was in school and doing these internships. Uh, it's kind of where it was founded from. Um, so it kind of went on for the next four or five years, building out apps, um, you know, built out around 20 different apps or so, and really you know, caught the bug for more mobile app development. Uh, internships took me to Facebook and Google and Silicon Valley. And um, in my last internship I was there, uh, my friend was an intern at Context Logic, which is kind of the legal name, parent company of Wish as a product. Uh, he introduced me to Peter, the CEO. Uh, my last internship was literally like two days before I was flying back to Waterloo for my last term. And, you know, we had a conversation. He kind of pitched me on coming to join them and start off the mobile efforts at Wish. Um, you know, I was kind of debating between that and going back to these big companies that I worked at and internships and the idea to be able to run an entire kind of mobile strategy for a company just seemed like too big of an offer to, to turn down. So I went and I joined Wish back then. We were about 10 people or so. Um, we weren't anything like what we are now as a product. We were more like a Pinterest style website. And my objective was to, you know, just see what that app could look like in the mobile space. And there was no you know, strategy about being a mobile commerce uh, focused company or anything like that at that point. Um, and so I you know, started working on the mobile app and you know, about a, a year or so in, we kind of recognized that mobile is the way to go. And so we pivoted our company a little bit and I took ownership over the entire consumer product side of the business. Um, kind of grew into the SVP of engineering there. Uh, eight and a half year long journey. It was an amazing journey. And like Nabil said, uh, culminating in hopefully an IPO uh, sometime in the next uh, couple of months. Um, but a couple of months ago, I decided to make the tough decision to leave and pursue my own personal passions in the automotive space and moved here to Bologna, Italy, which is like Nabil mentioned, uh, the motor valley of the world where uh, you have tons of different car companies here and uh, a lot of interesting opportunities. Um, yeah, that's my story. And, you know, uh, like with, with Ron's story, he spent some time at Twitter as well. And I, I know that you and I in preparing for this, uh, conversation, you mentioned some uh, recent innovations in, in Motor Valley around, uh, using Twitter for Formula E. Can you, can you share a little bit about that with the guests on the call? Yeah, you know, I think it, uh, the automotive space is going through a lot of really interesting transitions and you know one of those transitions is really that that merge between the you know the physical world and kind of this consumer app and consumer technology type of world and formula e i think has done a really good job of trying to take advantage of that and they've done that through a few different ways um you know they have on track experiences which are more similar to what you might see in like mario kart where there's you know if the driver goes offline in a specific turn uh, on screen you might see it look like this mario kart like booster um, but really on the track, it's kind of a couple of lines. And when the driver goes over that, he actually unlocks extra power. And that's something that they can do because the car is electrified. Um, but they've also done things to try to encourage more fan engagement. And so they have this concept of a fan boost where um, drivers who get their names tweeted by the fans up until a certain point in the race will actually unlock extra power that's available to them for five or 10 seconds throughout the lap. And I think it's, you know, it's a really interesting way to think about how you take what used to be kind of a, you know, old age technology of automotive and all of that and try to find ways to, to utilize what the world of technology and IT is learning and consumer apps and try to find a way to use that to, to make the, the sport more approachable to fans and also more enjoyable to fans. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot more of that coming out and there's a lot of similar types of things that are happening just in the regular you know, consumer automobile space as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we also talked about how, like, you know, some products are shipped as a platform and, you know, upgrades could be done over the air kind of thing. Obviously, Tesla has been pioneering some of that as well. So it's great to see other automotive companies kind of um, innovating in the space as well. Um, uh, over, I wanted to kind of turn back to Ron for a second, because, Ron, you've had, you've had, um, uh, almost 30 years in tech. And as you look back um, to kind of your journey, um, could you like think of like, or share a story um, of one of your like engineering teams an accomplishment that you're particularly proud of that, um, you know, the impact that it had on the wider business? Uh, you could pick any company really, but uh, can you share one of the stories uh, that you might have uh, something that 
you or your engineering team was able to accomplish? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question, Nabil. Um, and I can think of quite a few, several, but one maybe that comes to mind is when I was running engineering at Big Commerce, um, there's so many layers to this, but I was leading engineering for the global team. I was based in San Francisco. Uh, the team that I inherited was all in Sydney, and the co-founders were in Sydney. Um, and so product design and engineering were in Sydney. The rest of the business was in Austin, Texas. And so like sales, finance, support, marketing, uh, th those functions were all in Austin. And I was the initial person in San Francisco leading engineering globally, but also with the remit, the mandate to build the engineering team, grow the engineering in San Francisco, all different locations, um, but also to improve the core product. And for those that are not familiar, Big Commerce is uh, an e-commerce shopping platform. Uh, Big Commerce allows people to stand up uh, websites for for their storefronts. And you know that's uh, this is back in 2014. And um, one thing that's super important with commerce platforms is that okay, they need to be up. They're the virtual storefront. They actually have to um, communicate with end users, customers. And this is the way that, you know, these storefronts make money is that actually they can tra transact. Um, well, what's interesting about Big Commerce at the time when I joined it was uh, in the history of the company, I don't think they ever had a truly successful and flawless uh, holiday shopping season, which is the most important time for commerce. Uh, and merchants worldwide is the Cyber Five, so-called Cyber Five, uh, from Thanksgiving, Black Friday, all the way through Cyber Monday. And so, a few things um, in terms of the the multi-layered changes that we made at Big Commerce were: one, I, I staffed the team in San Francisco to the point where San Francisco became HQ2 for the company. Um, that allowed for better communication and coordination across Austin. San Francisco and Sydney, because with SF, we now had uh, an office that had time zone overlap during business hours with each of the two other offices. Um, third is uh, during my time there, I was the champion for the first and still only acquisition, a talent acquisition of a team that became the basis for some core technology that allows big commerce to uh, integrate with third party marketplaces, including like eBay, Amazon, but also Facebook and Pinterest in terms of those shopping aspects. Um, mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, you know, during that first, within those first few months, we laid out a plan to dramatically improve the uptime and performance of the storefronts. And so by the time that the holiday season rolled around, uh, we had 100% uptime um, and, you know, delighted our merchants and their customers. And so like in, in, with all those different things, just the, the coordination, the building of culture, the hiring up of San Francisco, and focusing on product. I, you know, I, I think we made some impacts in terms of the the people aspect, the team members, um, the process by which we coordinated and communicated, and the product. Not not just in terms of features and functionality, but also just how well it performed and how it was always available. And so, uh, you know, I'll, yeah. I like to think yes. that I played a small part in in the outcome this year. Yeah, well, that's quite an accomplishment, and uh, and also congratulations are in order for you because uh, Big Commerce IPO'd earlier this year, so uh, that's pretty that's pretty awesome. Congrats, man! So, um, but moving forward, uh, Eric on the live stream here is asking uh, specifically for you, Ron. Hi, I'm of the opinion that either everyone works at the same place or everyone works at their own place to prevent cliques and groupthink. What is your opinion on this and what advice would you have? Um, actually, could you maybe love some uh, so it's a, it's clarification? It's centered around like, uh, whether a, a team should be fully distributed um, or if they, there should be central HQ only, like a diametrically opposed model, not some hybrid thereof. But maybe you could speak to your experience with um, whatever models you were working with. Yeah, actually, that's a, Yeah, thank you for the clarification. And um, yeah, I will also admit I have yet to work in a fully distributed model, but um, you know, I I am open to it as potentially working. the The companies that I've worked in and the roles that I've had, we've generally been clustered around particular offices. And so, like I cite the example of SF and Canada, like Montreal, the East Coast, 
And so, yeah, that's the, that's kind of the traditional way that companies have historically expanded is, you know, you set up a physical office and you grow team members there. And um, each one of those is hopefully like a, a small version of headquarters. Uh, it's certainly one model that we're all mostly accustomed to. Um, uh, I think you can approach that if you start to think of uh, not just offices and particular cities, but time zones. And in some ways, like, you know, I think a lot of us have already been working this way. If you have a distributed team and there happens to be, you know, you consider it a, a West Coast time zone and maybe an East Coast time zone, maybe even a, you know, a South America time zone, um, you're kind of abstracting away a little bit the concept of, okay, they're all in one physical gathering space. Uh, and so like, that's, that's one way to approach, you know, what we're all used to generally, which is this high touch, high interaction, in-person uh, team assemblies. Um, but it does take work. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I can't lie. I can't say that it's going to be exactly the same as people being physically close. And so what I think we're all learning from what's happened in 2020 and COVID is even if pre-COVID you were all in, all in offices, suddenly now everyone is working from where they are. And uh, it just makes the need for communication and alignment and transparency that much more needed because it's, it's, uh, all, it's all electronic and we have to be more intentional in how we communicate. And I think that is the thing that scales, whether you're talking about different cities or different time zones, is how, how do the leaders of the company um, work at, at communication and keeping everyone aligned? Yeah, I mean, it's a very astute point. Um, we recently did an engineering survey where, uh, you know, time zone alignment consistently ranked at the top of like what also helps with team productivity. So um, even if the team is distributed, that that's certainly a contributing factor to helping that way. Um, and we actually have another interesting question here uh, for both speakers, for Tarek and Ron from Dave. So Dave is saying, hi, Ron and Tarek. I have recently been promoted to the engineering manager role, and I keep doubting myself whether I'm good enough to be one or not. What advice would you have for someone new in this role to be successful and become better? So maybe I'll turn it over to you, Tarek, first. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's a great question. Um, so I think you know it first should start off with understanding what the role actually entails. Um, I think it's really important to, to know what you know your requirements for yourself are and your team's requirements of you. Uh, being an engineering manager is a different role than being a tech lead or you know being an IC because your your project, your your product is no longer just the code that you're pushing out, but it's the you know effectiveness of your team, it's the satisfaction of your team, um, and it's ultimately the productivity of your team. And so, you know, one thing that you need to be thinking about is, you know, what are the skills that you can bring to the table that will help contribute to that for your team and help make things better for them and push the team forward. You know, a huge element of being a strong leader is just being a really good listener and, you know, building that relationship with your team members and understanding what their needs are and where you can provide added value. Uh, it's not a, necessarily about being the person that has to come up with all the ideas and being someone that uh, has to tell everyone exactly what to do or being even the smartest person in the room. Um, you know, a lot of times you won't be that smartest person in the room and that's okay. And that's something that, you know, you should maybe even be striving towards to build a strong, uh, a strong team that's going to, you know, create more value net in the future than it is right now. Um, and so I think, you know, constant communication with your direct reports, um, oftentimes new managers can kind of isolate themselves, either thinking they're doing really well or thinking they're doing poorly and be afraid to hear that feedback from, from their teammates. Um, but ultimately you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing your team a disservice. So, you know, I think, you know, have that confidence, um, have those conversations with, with your team and you know know that it's a process you're not going to be an amazing manager day one it's an iteration um just like you know if you're pushing out a new product you're not pushing out something that's going to be a billion dollar company in their first day it's going to take multiple rounds of iteration and you know as people we go through that same kind of iteration as well 
Um, you're going to fail a few times. There are going to be people that are going to be upset and that's normal. It happens. Um, and, you know, just work through those things, knowing that they're all uh, challenges that you have to overcome to become better. And obviously take advantage of things like this, mentorship programs where you can learn from other people who've gone through those challenges and are able to provide you some advice so that you can avoid some common pitfalls that you know, many people might go through. Um, so, you know, I think that's what I would advise to you. Those are some really great tips. Uh, Ron, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, there's a, I'll try to be concise. There's a lot I'd like to add to that. And there's a lot that I agree with there. But first I want to acknowledge the person that asked the question and that, you know, by, by you even having these thoughts, I mean, I think that's actually a good indicator, a good sign. Like the fact that you are so concerned, you, you really want to make sure that you're doing a great job. You wonder how you can get better at it. These are great instincts. And, you know, I would, I would be more worried if uh, sort of you had more hubris and said, okay, well, just like everything else I've done in the past, I can tackle this and it'll be no problem. Uh, and I think, you know, just sort of that, that understanding, I would even call it empathy for the people that report to you. I, I, I think, um, you know, I applaud you for that. And maybe that's part of the answer too, is in your career, and I don't know how long you've, you've been in industry, but in your career, you've had managers, I'm sure. Um, some of them you think were great. Some of them you think were not, maybe not so great. And so one of the things I would say is try to emulate, try to be the leader, try to be the manager uh, that you would want to have if you were a member of the team. And so maybe think think in the past, think through your your career about uh, patterns and anti-patterns that you've seen in managers or teams that you've been a part of or observed and just make that part of your tool chest because that's something that you can draw on. It's your personal experience. And so there are some things you can definitely glean from there. Um, and then again, just to try to stay concise, but there's so much I want to say about this, including again, agreeing with Tarek about this is a different role. And uh, I almost shudder to think of the, the phrase been promoted to manager um, because it's a different role. And, you know, in the companies that I've been in that have been very successful, there has been a parallel track for engineers and a parallel track for managers and career progression for engineers does not necessarily mean you have to be a people manager. It is a different role. And so even, you know, I, I'm remembering times in past companies where um, uh, I myself and, you know, other others on the leadership team have sort of corrected ourselves and trying not to make too much fanfare around someone being placed into the manager role and announcing that as a promotion. Um, promotion from a junior engineer to senior engineer to principal engineer, those are certainly promotions, but someone from a lead engineer to a first level manager, if, if I'm visualizing this right, it, it is just a different role. It doesn't necessarily say anything about value to the organization. It is just working in a different aspect. And so maybe if I can use a different analogy, for those that are familiar with American football, certainly if you're a, a second string quarterback and you get promoted to first string quarterback, starting quarterback, that is a promotion. But if you eventually become the passing coach for those quarterbacks, that's not necessarily promotion, it's a different role. And so that that is what I would always like just try to impart to everyone in the engineering profession is, um, you know, find the role that's right for you, find the role that where you get energy and whatever role you choose, whatever path you take, whether it's the IC path or the manager path, um, learn from your experiences and learn from others, as Tarek mentioned. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. And uh, the questions continue to, to roll in here. So I just want to try and get to as many of them as possible. Um, in any case, uh, Dave, congrats on the new uh, role that you have and thanks for joining us. Next question here is from Mary from, I believe, Facebook. How do you approach whiteboarding when you are brainstorming about an architecture when you are all remote? Um, Ron, do you want to take the first kick at that one? That is a really great question. Um, I'll admit that's a hard one because there's something tactile about standing around a whiteboard and just the expanse of it and the immediacy of it. Uh, that said, there are some tools out there that are trying to approach this. Um, there's one called Mural. Um, shoot, there's another one called Miro. Interestingly enough, they have similar names. I'm sure there's others. Um, you know, I'll, I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say like, it's, it's not going to be 100% replacement. Uh, so there are some things you can try to do virtually. Um, 
but it's not going to be exactly the same. Uh, and, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think whatever you can do electronically, even like just, just the collaboration aspect of it, even though it's electronic and even though the canvas is much smaller, whatever you can do with like Google Docs, Google Sheets, whatever, like Airtable, these, uh, these newer tools that are popping up um, and, and conversations, uh, you can try to approximate this. And, you know, another, another interesting approach might be, um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've actually seen people, I've been on Zoom calls where people have actually had their own like mini whiteboards and it, it kind of gets the creative juices flowing. Um, and then maybe afterwards you can sort of share and swap, uh, snapshots of your independent whiteboards. Um, so these are just some ideas I have, like, but I'll, I'll be the first to admit it's not going to be a 100% replacement. Thanks. And um, uh, Tarek, did you want to add anything to that? Or? Um, no, I think, you know, Ron covered a lot of it. I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, with this change of workflow, I think it is important to start thinking about how not only do we just take what we did before and just try to find a way to do that digitally, but think about like, are there new ways to work together that maybe make more sense. Like, you know, in the past when everyone's sitting in an office together and maybe it makes more sense to whiteboard a lot of things um, and just, you know, hop into a room and whiteboard. But now that might not be the most efficient way to communicate that specific idea, or maybe it's not even necessary for that idea. And you realize that now with this added friction that maybe this isn't the most optimal way to do it. So, you know, rather than thinking about how to always just take what we did before and still do the same thing, um, sometimes just rethinking the entire workflow might lead to you know, new innovations for how we do that work. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks so much for that. And um, Andy Saunders asks uh, for both of you, so maybe we'll start with Tarek on this one and then we'll move over to Ron, but what process or approaches do you recommend focusing on when going from a very small team to a large group? Say we go from five engineers who have worked as one team to 20 engineers where you could start to split into multiple teams. What are the key things you keep an eye on when going through such a transition? Tarek? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so I think there's a few things process-wise to, to definitely think about. Um, one, uh, code reviews is, is a pretty essential part of the process. You know, when you're five people, a lot of times code will just get pushed in and no one's reviewing things or you just kind of trust everyone going on. Um, but when you're 20 people, you need to have elements of code review. And it's not just because you don't trust the new people coming in. But code reviews can be an invaluable way to actually communicate what's changing in the code base to other members of the team, because you're just implicitly asking other people to kind of see what's going on and, and what's getting done. Um, so, you know, invest heavily in, you know, a proper code review process and make sure that people adopt it and use it on a regular basis. Um, I think also when you're growing to a team of 20 people, structure within the team is incredibly important. And kind of going back to the previous question about managers, um, you know, Oftentimes you'll find a, comp a company that's ballooning like this very quickly. They might just put all 20 people under a single manager when uh, you know, that person just got promoted or something and the team is growing. Ultimately, that manager is not going to be able to really provide guidance to all 20 people. Um, it's not going to be able to help them grow in their careers. And you know, that kind of dissatisfaction will start to brew and, and that will manifest itself into an unproductive team. So I think thinking through the structure as well of the team and structure it comes with it the thought process of how does that affect the ownership over the code as well. Um, so you might have uh, like functional structure, uh, you might have kind of a product based structure, it might be like areas of the stack, that's how you're going to structure it. Um, so I think these are all discussions that you have to have internally, which will breed processes for communication as well. Because once you have that structure, you're going to realize that you're going to need ways for those different elements of the structure to communicate with each other. Um, so, you know, that might manifest itself through documentation that you didn't have before, or ways of communicating that kind of through a written form, uh, or might manifest itself through kind of stand-ups or some kind of verbal syncs that you guys have with each other. Um, but ultimately, I think communication is that really big hurdle that you have to cross once you go from such a small team to such a big team. 
Thank you very much, Derek. Um, Ron, did you want to add anything to that one about leveling or layering teams and, and at different states of scaling? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, uh, um, again, I want to try to be brief, but yeah, it sounds like there's tremendous growth. So congratulations on that from five to 20 is a huge one. And uh, I'll uh, reiterate, yeah, the big thing here is communication across the team where before you were one team and you could literally stand up and, you know, when you were in an office and just talk and be on the same page. Now, as you start to go through this almost like cellular mitosis and start to spin up different teams, um, you need to think through, yeah, how are we going to be as well coordinated? How are we going to be aligned? How are we going to know what each of these different teams are working on? And so, you know, this is where um, engineers as well as like the managers and the leadership over, over the whole team have a big role. And that is how do we, you know, from the, from the project side, from the work side, how do we um, distribute the work in a way where we can still have these autonomous teams and it's coordinated and orchestrated in a way where together they can each work on their individual things, but then when it's put together, um, you know, we achieve this, this outsized result. And so it is about the communication, it's about building trust. And as you scale out these teams, I'm sure you're already thinking about this, but um, where you had five and now you have 20, well, I think it's important for you to try to seed some of those initial five across the number of teams that you might have, such that you can have this consistency across all and you know, this, uh, the subject matter expertise while you add new members to the team. Thanks a lot, Ron. Thanks for that. Um, another guest, uh, lots of remote questions here. So another guest is asking, so Accelerate was published in 2018 and just as quickly as it became the Bible of Agile, um, it has effectively become obsolete because most of the best practices it promotes depend on being in the same physical space. Is there an emerging equivalent for the remote work paradigm? Um, I'll pose that one to you, Ron. Yeah, um, super, super great question. And you know, I uh, like I've been in industry so long that I remember when the Agile Manifesto came out, and I was part of the, like the first set of people to go through the certified Scrum Master training. And maybe my approach to that also can apply here, which is. You know, when I first went through that initial agile training, uh, I took it as gospel. I took it as like, you know, Bible or whatever. And we tried to stick to the letter letter of the law. And, you know, for those that are familiar, of course, you do the sizing estimation, you estimate hours, you have burn down charts, all of these different things. And over time, what I've come to realize is it's less about crossing the T's and dotting the I's of any particular practice, but it is taking the concepts, taking the theories of agile and teamwork and ownership and autonomy and these things and tailoring it to the team and the team members and the company and then the situation. And of course, the situation now where everyone's remote is an interesting one. Um, but I think, you know, I, I wouldn't put too much weight in terms of specific practices and more think about, okay, what are we, what are we actually trying to do here? We actually want to make sure that everyone knows what our goals are, know how we're measuring against it, know what everyone's working on and knows how, like whether we succeeded or not. And then how do we iterate on that? Um, so this, this might be a cop out, but it is, my recommendation is to take all of these different um, processes, if you will, and procedures, Read, read them as maybe like aspirational and like perhaps ideal case, but then, you know, abstract away from that what you think is actually practical and you can apply. Because even when you're all in person, you're not going to necessarily be able to apply 100% of them. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks so much for that, Ron. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question here. So at Terminal, we interview a lot of developers and engineers. What are the qualities that you look for when hiring engineers? What have you recognized? Have you recognized any patterns over the years? So I'll pose that one to you, Terry. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Recruiting great engineers is a challenge for most companies and you know, figuring out what the right questions to ask, what are the right qualities to look for. And I think ultimately at its core, what we looked for in an engineer is ultimately that you are a problem solver. Um, so, you know, I know there's a lot of companies out there that might get hung up on like what programming languages, you know, 
um, and like syntax in interviews and things like that. But you know, those are all things that you can pick up on the job and you can pick up from Stack Overflow and copying and pasting sample code from all over the place. But being able to be plopped into the middle of a, a tough, complex problem and having to figure out what are the right tools to actually use to solve that problem, that's a skill that a solid engineer it needs to have and will allow them to shine at their job. Um, so, you know, we definitely for our interviews try to stay away from things that are just pure, you know, implement this algorithm, implement a binary search or something like that. But try to create as, as much as possible real life scenarios, real life problems that a person might encounter on the day to day and assess the engineer on their ability to use their tool chest to find the right elements of that solution that yield a result. Um, you know, one pattern that we saw quite a lot with people who you know, were very theoretical, went to great universities, but just really never had any industry experience or maybe even like side project experience. They'd focus so much on trying to build the best solution. But, you know, kind of like you know, the agile question before, things change very constantly, like frequently. And, you know, what might be the best solution yesterday might not be the best solution today. And the time you'll waste in trying to come up with the ultimate best solution usually for a company like Wish or any kind of you know, growing product is time you can't waste. And so really what we're looking for in engineers are people who are problem solvers, but they also need to be a little bit hacky. Someone that's able to think about, you know, what tools do I have that I can use that get the job done and you know, don't create more harm down the line and tech debt and things like that that are obviously going to outweigh the gains of, of this current launch. Um, and these are all things that you know, they're difficult to assess in a short interview. Um, they take a lot of iteration on the types of questions that you ask. And, you know, they take some pattern matching through the people that you hire and, and what, you know, they look like and what they kind of answered in the interviews. And I don't think we ever got to the perfect interview either towards the end. Um, but that was kind of the ideal end goal of what we were looking for in a great engineer that we wanted in the team. Thanks for that. And uh, Ron, did you want to add anything about the qualities you look for in a great engineering hire? Um, yeah, I'll just add on to what Tarek said, like everything you said, and, you know, I look for characteristics like, um, how practical are they? Do they have potential to grow in the role? Are they, how communicative are they with other team members? I don't want to just hire engineers that go off into a corner. I want people that are going to collaborate and think about teamwork. Um, and, and yeah, just like, are they a great cultural fit as well? Um, and because that's, you know, the, the tactics, the, the skills of languages, you can learn those things, but uh, you can't necessarily teach someone to be a great teammate that has to somehow be innate in them, in my opinion. Thanks a lot, Ron. Really appreciate that. Um, this one's a fun one. So we'll start off with Tarek here, but uh, do you still like to program? What was the last software you programmed? What did it do? What language was it written in? And when did you program it? So yes, I still love to program. Uh, you know, I love to program through my entire time at Wish. Even when I was leading a team of you know 150 plus people, I'd like to carve out little projects for myself so I could still keep programming. Um, but yeah, immediately after I left Wish, I uh, coded something up with my brother actually. Um, you know, kind of in the spirit of this whole uh, EIR program and mentorship. You know, we recognized that as the world was going online and you know, there was a lot of people losing their jobs. Um, we saw a lot of these messages on LinkedIn where people were messaging each other, just saying you know, about their current situation, they lost a job, they're looking for help or they're looking for guidance on uh, resume advice or things like that. And there really wasn't a good platform for people to connect and, and you know, give advice to other people, unless you're someone with a lot of LinkedIn connections or you know, uh, pretty popular on, on Twitter, or, uh, you know, LinkedIn or uh, Facebook or something, you likely wouldn't be able to really give back to that type of community. So uh, we built a, a kind of a little social messaging app where you can create a little profile um, and put out requests for help. And as a mentor, you can kind of list yourself as a mentor and help someone else out, um, just get a request. And if you think you can help out, you just accept it and go through. Uh, it's an app called Nadini. Uh, it's on Android and iOS. And for me, it was actually more of an exercise to get back into just coding things uh, you know, full stack. And uh, we actually built it all in Dart, um, which was a language I'd never written in before. 
um, you know, use Dart so that we on the front end we could just have the same app for Android and iOS, but we actually use Dart for the back end as well, which you know is not really a language and uh, that's really used for server stack. Uh, there's not very much in the ways of APIs and SDKs that are built out for it, but uh, it was a fun challenge for myself, and you know, I came out of it knowing a lot more about Dart and you know, feeling better about my technical accomplishment there. And uh, you know, hopefully, the app that's out there that might help people down the line too. Cool, and that's uh, Nadini N A D E E N I. So um, over to you, Ron. Ron, what was the last thing that you coded up, and uh, what 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 languages uh, were you working with? Yeah, okay, same question. So um, yeah, I'm thinking through the last things I did. And so one of them was prompted by the fact that at Carta, the data engineering team started rolling to me, data engineering and data science and data analytics. And I'd always thought, well, shoot, I really wanna learn more about machine learning and AI. And that gave that finally gave me like the day-to-day -day need to be like, yeah, I should get closer to this stuff. And so uh, there, what I did was I en en enrolled in this Coursera course, it's one of those MOOCs. Uh, machine learning um, coded up, you know, went through that whole process. Uh, every week there was some sort of like programming assignment, and it, boy, did that bring me back to like university days. Is all right. Well, now I'm going to like code up something that approaches a neural network or like a you know gradient descent to try to get to the optimal um, parameters. Really, really interesting. Uh, wow. And so I really immersed myself. So that was one of the more recent things. And then prior to that, just thinking about it. Um, my, my younger son is in high school, and so he's been taking some computer programming classes. A lot of this has been in JavaScript, and one of the things he was doing was, okay, programming a game in JavaScript. And so there, of course, like the nerd tendencies in me sort of started to reach out in terms of like how his code was structured, whether there were method calls, whether there was repeated code. And so like, yeah, I um, probably dove too much, had too much um, enthusiasm for cleaning up the code in terms of software engineering versus just getting the assignment done for my son. So those are the, those are the two examples. One is uh, adjacently related to my job. One was uh, home life. But then in terms of, um, you know, on the job, it's been, I'll, I'll admit, it's been quite a while since I've been hands-on uh, uh, on the code for a critical path of my company. That would have been probably back in my Salesforce days. Fair enough. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, we'll move on to the next question. Just a reminder to those on the live stream audience that uh, this is a last call for uh, asking any final questions because we got to wrap up in about five minutes. But uh, I'll move on to the next question. I know that there are people joining us who are both experienced individual contributors and experienced engineering managers in different countries around the world. What advice would you give to those people who are not interested in moving from their hometowns to say Silicon Valley, if they want to build the future from their own countries. So maybe uh, we could start with uh, Ron on that one. Okay. Um, well, I mean, that's, I think this is really interesting because, you know, um, Tarek mentioned that when he graduated Waterloo, he could have stayed in town, worked for Blackberry Rim, uh, uh, you know, and that was, you know, something that he could have chosen. When I graduated university, yeah, I was in Illinois. And at the time, it would have been everyone's dream to stay in Illinois and work at Motorola, which at the time was this amazing place to work. Um, uh, and un like, unfortunately, I, I didn't, so I had to move to Texas. Um, I would have rather have stayed in my own like, state back in the day. Um, and of course, now I'm in Silicon Valley. But th this is a really interesting question. And I think what's interesting about it is, yeah, perhaps 2020 is, is kind of tailwinds to this whole effect of there's great talent everywhere and companies are more willing than ever to try to seek them out. Um, what's also been interesting for me personally is for me to learn about uh, time zone alignment with respect to Central and South America as well as Canada. Like these are all places that are, again, if you think of not just cities, but think of the world uh, and maybe certain hemispheres as time zones. Well, the, if you happen to be in the same time zone as a, a company headquartered in New York or one hour removed, it's not it's not that difficult to stay coordinated. And so I think the opportunities now are, are more than ever through companies and services like Terminal and others. Um, and yeah, I would just say 
it's been surprising to me. And again, maybe it's because of the tailwinds that COVID has, has brought forth, but uh, you see more and more of these companies with their job postings, no longer necessarily saying you have to be in a particular city. Yeah, sure, the company might be based in San Francisco or New York or somewhere else, but many of these job postings now say remote. And I think part of that's also because uh, founders, CEOs, engineering leaders have experience and they, they see that you can get great talent anywhere, whether that's Waterloo or Montreal or Buenos Aires or Rio or Guadalajara, there's there's a great talent everywhere. So um, I, I, I think stick to your guns, trust your gut, where, live where you want to live. And you know that might change over your career. Maybe right now you wanna stay where you are, but over time, maybe you do wanna to move to San Francisco or New York, but I don't think there's a, there's anything that says you have to now. Yeah, and that's like a good segue into into Tarek, who actually um, moved out of Silicon Valley to, to Italy. But uh, do you have any opinions on this, uh, Tarek, in terms of uh, building the future from anywhere kind of thing? Yeah, so you know, I think one thing that people discount a lot is local knowledge is massive for growing a business. Um, and, you know, an anecdote from Wish. You know, we were launching Wish Local. And, you know, our team was all in San Francisco and we're trying to build a product that scales to the whole world. And Wish Local was our you know, partnership with mom and pop shops to do package pickups. And we were trying to grow in Italy, actually. And, uh, you know, we're sitting there in San Francisco trying to think up of a product ideas of, you know, how do we incentivize store owners to get other stores to sign up to our program and all of that. Um, but we also had this program open for our Wish Stars, which are like our elite shoppers to also help us out, too. And we noticed overnight that Italy as a single country grew, was the fastest growing country in terms of store signups. It had nothing to do with anything that we were doing, but actually this one wish star who knew the market really well, knew that there's these stores here called tabaccarias, which are kind of, they're tobacco shops. But if you know the Italian market, you realize that these are stores that are actually doing all kinds of services for everyone here, including you know, buying administrative stamps and all kinds of other things. And you know, they're a tight community. And if you talk to those people, you can actually you know, grow a product really quickly um, and get this viral nature just by knowing where those people you know, chat with each other on forums and things like that. And you know, this one person who's not an engineer or anything like that was able to outpace all of the engineering work that the team in San Francisco is trying to do. And I think there's so many of those examples all around the world. And you see lots of examples of large companies where you know they're losing to smaller competitors that are local in their market because those competitors know their market so well and they're able to optimize their product. And sometimes you have those competitors get bought out, you know, like Amazon buying souk.com in the Middle East or something like that. And sometimes you have the compet the local competitor actually win and hold on to that market. So I think, you know, look at your location as also a strength and what can you bring to the table with your local knowledge and with your expertise of the market and what the customer there actually wants. And a lot of times you can create value that you wouldn't be able to create just being a team in San Francisco or in New York. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to, you know, keep at it in your own home country. Yeah. You know, it's uh, really interesting. And if, if I may just add, like one of our most recent Tech Talk speakers was Alex Lazaro, who's a venture capital investor. And he recently wrote a book called Out Innovate, how global entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit are rewriting the rules of Silicon Valley. And just two statistics that pop into my mind that, you know, from that book is that, you know, startups valued at over 1 billion are popping up all over the world as global tech communities continue to innovate. Like, for example, uh, China is now home to 35% of the world's unicorns, which is up from a mere 4% in 2014. And then on the like other side of the equation, on the funding side, in the 1990s, 95% of the world's venture capital was located in the USA, but now the figure is more like 50%. So we will continue to see like these shifts and like uh, the, the world being more globally competitive with tech. And so it's uh, really interesting to see how that continues to unfold day by day. But um, with that being said, I just want to be uh, mindful of time here. And I just want to just take this opportunity to say that, you know, both of you, both of you uh, Ron and Tarek, have been successful in your career. And 
Um, you know, you don't have to do this, but but clearly you, you want to do this. You want to pay it forward and give back and help kind of inspire the, the leaders of the future and, and engineers who, uh, who want to come up and um, hopefully follow a career path similar to yours. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being part of the executive and residence program that we're pioneering here at Terminal. And so, uh, you know, Tarek, you're, you're joining us. It's late early. Ron, it's still, uh, it's just about, just flipped from morning to afternoon for you. Um, and I want to also thank all the people who have taken time out of their day to join us and kind of invest in themselves and invest in learning. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll say and I'll leave you with is that um, we do these talks on a regular basis. <clears throat> if you're interested in previous talks, like the one I just mentioned, it's just terminal.io slash tech talks. Um, and so you'll see the library and the archive there. Another thing I just wanted to mention that we have on the go right now is uh, we do these tech takes on hackathons. So um, we theme them uh, based on, you know, really important issues of the day. And right now we believe that, you know, it's really important for people to understand and invest in kind of mental wellness. And so our tech takes on mental health hackathon is happening right now. And we're accepting project submissions up until December 7th. And we're also giving away thousands of dollars in prizes that the winners get to choose where the money goes. So if any of that's uh, interesting to you, please reach out to us at Terminal. My email is just nabil at terminal.io. But once again, uh, normally I'd ask for a round of applause if we were doing this in a room in one of our campuses, but I can't do that right now. But, but thank you so much, Tarek. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, this was a wonderful way for us to spend an hour and hopefully uh, some of the folks on the live stream got a lot out of it. But with that, I can say that it's a wrap and thank you, Eric, uh, for running the live stream um, and you can wrap it up now. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time.